Okay, back to it. Uh, speaker, next speaker, uh, Robert Murray Hugh Adams from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And his paper is entitled Power, Cause, and Law in Malebranche's Occasionalism. First of all, let me join in uh, thanking Eric and everybody else who has planned and organized this conference for a very uh, exciting and uh, welcoming occasion. Uh, okay, I, I think that Malbranche, uh, Malbranche developed a theory, a theory of causation uh, that is arguably the uh, best developed, most developed uh, modernist philosophical theory of causation in the 17th century and uh, clearly one of the most influential uh, treatments of causation in the 17th century and for the 18th century. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, theory. Uh, what I wanted to talk about here is not just the occasionalist theory as such, uh, but uh, a wider complex of Malbranche's views on broadly causal issues. And in particular, I'm interested not only in this, but especially, uh, particularly on this occasion, in ferreting out the variety of causal concepts that play a role, not always a, uh, an immensely self-conscious role uh, in Malbranche's uh, thinking. And I begin with what one, uh, what I think of as the first version of Malbranche's occasionalism, uh, which is the theory and in particular the main line of argument for it uh, that we find in uh, Malbranche's first publications on the subject uh, from the years roughly 1674 to 81, uh, which uh, includes uh, the first four editions of the Search After Truth, the Recherche de la Verité, uh, and the first, I think it's, it's the first two editions, at least two editions, uh, of his treatise on nature and grace. And uh, then I want to move on to talk about Malbranche's views about free will, uh, which uh, can easily seem to be in tension with his occasionalism. And uh, I think that that relationship is uh, very interesting uh, for nosing out the variety of causal concepts that uh, Malbranche is using. And I will argue that Malbranche's views on free will are in fact not inconsistent with his occasionalism, at least as that was developed in the first version of the theory. And the, uh, if, if I have time, I want to go on and say some things about the rather different line of thought, uh, different line of argument for the theory, of which I, for one, don't think is particularly successful, uh, that, Malbranche, uh, that, that developed in Malbranche's uh, later work and say a bit about why it developed and what's to be said about it. So, version one of Malbranche's occasionalism. And uh, I begin with the, what is, I think, rightly seen as the main argument, uh, occasionalist argument in this uh, version, which is, an among other things, an argument that God is the only true cause. And uh, he, Malbranche lays it out in the, uh, the recherche in three steps. Step one, a true cause is a cause between which and its effect the mind perceives a necessary connection. That's how I understand it. That looks like a definition, and I will, in effect, treat it as such. And then the second premise, now there is nothing but the infinitely perfect being between whose will and the effects the mind perceives a necessary connection. And then the conclusion from those two premises is, so there is nothing but God that is a true cause. Uh, 
that's not as precisely stated as it should have been, I think. I think a conclusion that better fits the argument and is indeed the operative first principle of Malebranche's occasionalism is that only volitions of the infinitely perfect being, God, are true causes. Um, uh, and indeed, the, the, the second premise should have been, uh, there is nothing between which and its effects the mind perceives a necessary connection, connection except the volitions of the infinitely perfect being. That would have been, I think, more accurate. Uh, why do I say that? Well, Malbranche didn't believe that there is, in fact, a necessary connection uh, of, the sort that he, of the sort and strength that he had in mind between God as, and, as a being uh, and any effects in the world. Uh, for he held that God's freedom implies that nothing external to God follows necessarily uh, from God's being or, for that matter, from God's mere faculty of will as distinct from uh, volitions which are exercises of that, that faculty. Um, thus, uh, as uh, Malbranche says uh, in the course of, a, of debates with Arnaud, uh, God is free in the creation of the world. He is able not to make anything. And as God is fully self-sufficient, it is indifferent to him whether to act externally, or, or not to act. Uh, for this reason, I think that Malbranche's uh, true causes are states of affairs, or perhaps better, modifications of substances, and not the substances as such. Uh, and that's important to the array of causal concepts uh, that I see in Malbranche. So, uh, point B, uh, Malbranche concludes that nothing created, and specifically no act or state of any created thing, is a true cause from which an effect necessarily follows, because he doesn't, uh, he thinks the mind perceives no necessary connection uh, between any such created uh, act or state and a following effect. Uh, uh, a line of argument that, of course, will remind all of us uh, of. Uh, uh, famous arguments of Hume, uh, which, in fact, were borrowed from Malebranche. This applies, this conclusion applies in Malebranche's view, regardless of whether the cause, supposed cause, is corporeal or mental, and in each of those cases, regardless of whether the effect is corporeal or mental, uh, or of whether the effect is in the same or in a different individual substance. Thus we get the conclusion, all natural causes are not true causes, but only occasional causes. Okay, central, one of the central concepts of Malebranche's occasionalism naturally is the concept of an occasional cause. What are occasional causes and do they make a difference? Uh, in other words, is there any reason to think of them as causes? Well, occasional causes, do, as Malbranche says, determine the author of nature to act in such and such a way, in such and such an eventuality. Uh, that's because, that's, Malbranche says, that's because he has willed certain laws according to which, for example, motion is communicated upon the collision of bodies. And because these laws are efficacious, they, that is the laws, act. The laws are conditional in form. For instance, if bodies collide in this way, they will move after the collision in that way. The occasional cause, for instance, the collision, uh, is something that satisfies the condition. And when the condition is satisfied, the efficacy of the conditional law produces the consequence, in this case, the subsequent motion. In this way, I take it, occasional causes do really contribute, in Malebranche's view, to explaining why things happen. But the true cause to which the, eff the efficacy of the laws is due is exclusively God's volition. Okay, that's the theory in a nutshell. Um, what about the laws? 
What are they? The causal laws, laws of nature, what are they for Malbranche, and what is their role in causation? Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting complex of questions, and here it's going to be a little harder to be sure of the correct interpretation of Malbranche. One thing that is clear is that it is as volitions of God that the laws are efficacious and act. Specifically, the laws are general volitions of God. This theme is particularly well developed in Malbranche's treatise on nature and grace uh, in 1680 and 1681. Parts of it, it was first published in 1680 and then Malbranche added some things in 1681. I say, Albrecht says, I say that God acts by general volitions when he acts in consequence of the general laws that he has established. Uh, and in, this, in the same section, Malbranche refers to the laws as general and efficacious laws that he has established. I say, on the other hand, that God acts by particular volitions when the efficacy of his will is not determined by some general law to produce, produce some effect. Now, Malbranche holds the view that God is obliged, obliged by God's perfection, to act always in a manner that is worthy of him. Uh, and what's a manner that's worthy of God? It's to act in ways that are simple, general, constant, and uniform. Uh, the uh, acting, uh, as it were, by general laws is something that is itself. It's not a means to an end for uh, Malbranche's God. It's uh, that is itself uh, uh, necessarily an expression of the divine perfection. Such action is required, Malbranche says, by God's wisdom, uh, which he loves more than his worth, a phrase that's very important uh, in Malbranche's theodicy, and in that context, I must confess, very hard to swallow, but I'm not talking here about Malbranche's theodicy, so I won't say more about that. As Malbranche sees it, God therefore prefers to act almost always by general rather than particular volitions, and thus by universal laws. Uh, and here I'm going largely to pass over uh, a section about miracles. Uh, uh, miracles do occur, according to Malbranche, uh, but rarely. Uh, and 